Morning, everybody. Please do sit down. Uh, reach with uh, for a Bible with me, if you would, and turn to page 745. You'll find Daniel chapter 7 there. If you're in one of your own Bibles, we've been working our way through Daniel, as you know, if you've been here the last six weeks or so, and uh, this morning, chapter 7. We've already had the first part read, so I'll read the second half in just a second. But first, let me lead us in prayer. Thank you again, almighty Lord, that Jesus is the Son of Man, that all authority in heaven and on earth belongs to him. And we pray very simply that you would help us to grow in our confidence in him this morning, in our devotion to him, in our gratitude for him, in our love for him, and our worship of him, so that we might stand firm for him in this world. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Let me read to us then from, uh, starting from verse 15 on page 745, halfway through Daniel 7. As for me, Daniel, my spirit within me was anxious, and the visions of my head alarmed me. I approached one of those who stood there and asked him the truth concerning all this, so he told me and made known to me the interpretation of the things. These four great beasts are four kings who shall arise out of the earth. But the saints of the Most High shall receive the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever, forever, and ever. Then I desired to know the truth about the fourth beast, which was different from all the rest, exceedingly terrifying with its teeth of iron and claws of bronze, and which devoured and broke in pieces and stamped what was left with its feet. And about the ten horns that were on its head, and the other horn that came up, and before which three of them fell, the horn that had eyes and a mouth that spoke great things and that seemed greater than its companions. As I looked, this horn made war with the saints and prevailed over them. Until the Ancient of Days came and judgment was given for the saints of the Most High, and the time came when the saints possessed the kingdom, Thus he said, as for the fourth beast, there shall be a fourth kingdom on earth, which shall be different from all the kingdoms, and it shall devour the whole earth and trample it down and break it to pieces. As for the ten horns out of this kingdom, ten kings shall arise and another shall arise after them. He shall be different from the former ones and shall put down three kings. He shall speak words against the Most High and shall wear out the saints of the Most High and shall think to change the times and the law. And they shall be given into his hand for a time, times and half a time. But the court shall sit in judgment and his dominion shall be taken away to be consumed and destroyed to the end. And the kingdom and the dominion and the greatness of the kingdoms under the whole heaven shall be given to the people of the saints of the Most High. His kingdom shall be an everlasting kingdom, and all dominions shall serve and obey him. Here is the end of the matter. As for me, Daniel, my thoughts greatly alarmed me, and my color changed, but I kept the matter in my heart. Please do keep that open in front of you. There's also an outline of the sermon where we're heading on the back of the notice sheet inside your Bibles, I think. Um, I want to start, if I may, by talking about foundations. Um, Back down in London, we used to live just down the road from the Shard for a while. It was the tallest building in Europe, 72 stories high. We don't go quite that high in St. Andrews, over two and a half million kilos in weight, Wikipedia tells me. Unsurprisingly, it has uh, very deep foundations. So it sits, in fact, on 390 steel and concrete piles, each almost a a meter wide and drilled over 60 meters into the ground to the bedrock, because everyone knows that without the right foundations, no building is going to stand firm. You may know that Jesus took the imagery of a building's foundations and used it as a metaphor for life. Uh, The foolish man, he said, built his life on sand. And so when the storms of life, and especially of God's judgment, came, his house came crashing down. But the wise man, said Jesus, built his house upon the rock. And so when the rains came, the building of his life stood firm. 
And Jesus was asking, what about your life? Is your life built on the, the rock solid foundation of God and his truth? Or is it built on the sinking sands of the world and its opinions? And I can't think of a better uh, analogy than foundations as we come to Daniel 7. Daniel 7, I'm persuaded, is a chapter that is aiming to drill deep foundations of truth into our soul. It's the theological heart of the book. It's a, a panoramic survey of the history of the entire world from God's perspective. And I'm hoping it will fill us with faith and with hope in Christ this morning. Um, so far in Daniel, in these court scenes that we've had, we've had lots of wonderful examples of courageous faith, men who remained true and faithful to God, even when their life was on the line. And within the structure of the book, the truths of chapter seven are, are the engine that drives and inspires the courage and commitment that we've been seeing over the last few weeks. So chapter seven is a bridge between the, the two halves of the book. On the one hand, it, it rounds off chapters two to seven. If you've been here, um, we've said chapters two to seven were written in a different language, Aramaic. That's the, the popular tongue of the day. It's because they have a, a message for the whole world to hear and not just the people of God. And uh, this chapter rounds that off, announcing who's the true king in the world. On the other hand, chapter 7 also starts chapters 7 to 12. It's a very different style of writing. You'll have noticed that even as soon as it was read. It's often called apocalyptic. It's uh, in Daniel, a series of four incredible visions that God gives to Daniel. It's a style of writing that is full of imagery and metaphor. Someone said um, reading the second half of Daniel is less like reading a book and more like watching uh, a weird movie. And some people love that kind of writing and some people struggle with it. Martin Luther said of um, the writers of apocalyptic literature like this, that they have a queer way of talking, is what he said. Like people who, instead of proceeding in an orderly manner, ramble off from one thing to the next so that you cannot make head or tail of them or see what they're getting at. You may have conversations like that over coffee uh, after church. You may have some sympathy for Luther as uh, we read Daniel 7. But I want to say, and I hope we'll see this plainly over the next few weeks, that actually for all of the complexity of the detail and for all the way that our minds don't often, most of us work in these kind of graphic images and pictures, the big message in the second half of Daniel is actually pretty simple. Uh, these chapters lift the veil on heavenly reality and they reassure us that God really is on the throne of the universe. That's what they're here to do. And they give us that conviction because that truth is the deep foundation that we're gonna need if we're gonna keep living for God in a world that is largely hostile to him. Let's dive straight in. Two headings this morning. First, be realistic about the beastly kingdoms of man. And we'll start in verse one again. In the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel had a dream. Visions passed through his mind as he was lying in bed. He wrote down the substance of his dream. Just the chronology. We've jumped back. Um, we're now between the time of chapter four and chapter five. It's 552 BC. Belshazzar has taken the throne. And Daniel sees this vision that really needs a health warning. You see verse 15, he's left anxious and alarmed by it. Verse 28, the color drained from his cheeks. I felt a bit like that as I was preparing, if I'm honest with you. But verse 2 will show us why. Daniel said, in my vision at night, I looked. And there before me were the four winds of heaven churning up the great sea. Four great beasts, each different from the others, came up out of the sea. We get God's interpretation in verse 17. These four beasts represent four kings who will arise out of the earth. And they not only represent the literal empires of Babylon and her successors, they also speak more generally to us about the nature of all human kingdoms and power ever since the fall. And the first thing to notice is their terrifying power. Beast number one is in verse four. Daniel says it's like a lion had the wings of an eagle. I watched until its wings were turned off. It was lifted from the ground so that it stood on two feet like a man. 
and the heart of a man was given to it. And this line's meant to be a picture of King Nebuchadnezzar and his powerful kingdom. There's a few times in the Bible he's compared to a lion, and in chapter 4, where God humbled him, his hair was compared, using these same words, to an eagle's feathers. Then here, the wings are plucked off. He's lifted from the ground. He stands like a man and given the mind of a man. And it reminds us how in chapter 4, God restored Nebuchadnezzar uh, for a time. So beast one is Nebuchadnezzar or Babylon. Second beast in verse 5 looked like a bear, we're told. It was raised up on one of its side. It had three ribs in its mouth between its teeth. It was told, get up and eat your fill of flesh. And we'll see a vision of a ram next week in chapter 8. The two are pretty similar. Uh, it represents the kings of the Medo-Persian Empire that succeeded Babylon. Just like a, a bear, this empire was known for its size and its ferocity. It's pictured here as bloodthirsty. It has bits of leftover flesh from its victim stuck between its teeth. The third beast in verse 6 looked like a leopard. On its back, it had four wings like those of a bird. This beast had four heads, and it was given authority to rule. The leopard known for its speed, its thirst for blood. It's a fitting image for Alexander the Great. He made his first incursion into Turkey in 334 BC. Um, history books tell us within 10 years, he'd conquered lands all the way to the borders of India. And uh, legend tells us he then wept because there were no more lands left to conquer. But the main focus and the thing that Daniel asks about a bit later is the fourth beast. Uh, verse 7 describes it as terrifying and frightening and very powerful. Had large iron teeth, it crushed and devoured its victims. We read it trampled underfoot whatever was left. It was different from all the former beasts. It had ten horns. While I was thinking about the horns there before me was another horn, a little one, which came up among them. And three of the first horns were uprooted before it. This horn had eyes like the eyes of a human being and a mouth that spoke boastfully. When Daniel asks about it later, he's told in verse 23, this fourth kingdom will devour the whole earth, trampling it down and crushing it. So this beast is in a different league. It's so violent and vengeful that Daniel is terrified. Um, ten horns, because it's so powerful, horn often to do with power. And then this other little horn appears, intelligent human eyes, a boastful mouth. It does two things, and um, it blasphemes God, and it oppresses God's people. So it wages war against God's people. And even for a time, terrifyingly, prevails over them. Uh, people have long debated the identity of this little horn, and I should say there are, there are loads of good Bible scholars on the side of loads of different debates that come up in these next few chapters of Daniel. Some say that Antiochus Epiphanes IV is the guy in view here, um, the king of Syria. In 167 BC, he attacked and desecrated the Jewish temple in Jerusalem. He also sought to replace the traditional 365-day solar calendar with a 360-day lunar calendar that matches some of the details that we read about here. Other people point to the anti-Christian persecution of um, the Roman Empire in the first century. Again, that fits some of the, the details. I'm not persuaded myself that this little horn is meant to represent just one king. I think rather with the chapter, it's a picture of every ruler or kingdom that will ever emerge in the world and set itself up in opposition to God and his people. Uh, sometimes the Bible calls them antichrists because they oppose Christ, they oppose God, they oppose his people, and they are serving the, the interest of the devil himself. Well, so much for the detail of the beasts, each of them powerful and violent in their own right. They're alarming. But it's actually, I think, when we step back and view them as a whole, that the true horror emerges. I'm persuaded with many others that this is God's description of human history as a whole. It's his analysis of the way that we tend to use power as human beings. And he's saying that as a whole, the kingdoms of the world will not act as agents of peace and justice, but will instead pursue their own ends, 
and will dominate and devour each other if they have to. And the writer doesn't want us to be naive, therefore, about the world, or to be alarmist, but to be realistic. He's saying there is something fundamentally beastly about the kingdoms of men, that it, it's normal and typical in our world for worldly power to be used in a way that opposes God and oppresses his people. If ever we're living in a time in history where it's not like that, we should be very grateful because it's the exception. And the point is that these realistic expectations are here to strengthen the foundations of God's people. Um, Daniel's first readers had really high hopes. We've thought about this a bit uh, for what life would be like when the exile came to an end. And many were hoping for this golden age just around the corner, a time when all of the nations would honor God and when his people would flourish and prosper. But if that's what we expect, if we're expecting our world to love God and to embrace his people, then our spiritual foundations will be forever unstable. And when inevitable opposition comes, our house will come crashing down. That's why we need this reality drilled deep into our soul. There's a great danger of being seduced by worldly power. There's a great danger of being naive about it. This realism will strengthen us to stand firm, even when the weight of worldly power turns against God's people. And it will help us too to remember that the, even if the power of these beasts is terrifying, it is also temporary. Um, it's the second sub point here. You've um, spotted, even as the, you may have spotted, even as the beasts were being described, their power was clearly constrained. So just to scan over it again, if you can track with me still, in verse four, the, the wings of the beast are torn off uh, and then it's lifted up. And then a mind is given to it. The verbs are, are passive. It's not something that the beast is doing for itself. It's something that God is doing. Because even though the beast is scary, its power is not ultimate. Then the second beast is told to get up and eat. Because the only authority that it possesses is authority that was delegated to it by another. Again, the third beast in verse 6 is given authority to rule. So there were reminders all the way through that there is a higher throne as we were singing. And the place it's seen most clearly is when the judgment finally falls on this little horn. It's described first in verse 11. Daniel says, I continued to watch because of the boastful, word, boastful words that the horn was speaking. I kept looking until the beast was slain and its body was destroyed and thrown into the blazing fire. Again, verse 26, the court will sit, his power will be taken away and completely destroyed forever. So we've got this picture, the, the beastly kingdoms of the world have a, a power that is terrifying. But they will only ever operate within the, the overall sovereign purposes of God and only ever for a time. And the day is coming, God's people needed to be reassured, when all opposition to God will be destroyed forever. And that certainty, again, is another part of the foundation that will inspire a life of courageous faith. Again, for the first hearers and for those that were reading it as Jews through the succeeding centuries, as these kingdoms came and went, they needed to be reminded that they weren't ultimate. Second major heading, and I hope things will become a, a little clearer in this section if they're not already. Be reassured that Jesus is enthroned forever. Be reassured that Jesus is enthroned forever. So we've had lots of frenzy and violence from these beasts, but there's almost a calmness to verse 9. As I looked, we read, thrones were set in place, and the Ancient of Days took his seat. His clothing was as white as snow. The hair of his head was white like wool. His throne was flaming with fire, and its wheels were all ablaze. A river of fire was flowing, coming out from before him. Thousands upon thousands attended him, 10,000 times 
10,000 stood before him. I don't know if you read um, Philip Pullman's uh, trilogy, His Dark Materials. Um, Pullman goes off on one about this title, The Ancient of Days, in Daniel 7. He describes it as a, an appropriate name for God because he's far past his best, he says, and on the verge of extinction, ancient, no longer strong and youthful. But far from suggesting that God is frail or senile, this is a, a name that is full of grandeur and dignity and wisdom. His clothing and hair are the purest white. There's not a, a trace of imperfection anywhere in God. Absolutely pure in all of his ways. His throne flames with fire. There's a power to it has a river of fire flowing from before him to symbolize the judgment that will flow from his throne and over the kingdoms of men. And he's attended by angels, thousands upon thousands, 10,000 times 10,000, all are gathered to serve and worship him because he is that worthy. And so the heavenly court sits and the evidence is weighed and the horn is found guilty. And the dispensing of justice is, is effortless, isn't it? There's no final showdown like in Lord of the Rings or something. There's no grand battle. The beast is simply slain, body destroyed, thrown in the fire. And unlike Daniel's friends when they were thrown into the blazing furnace, there is no one to rescue the beast. So the stage is finally clear for this new vision. If you know any verses in Daniel 7, I suspect it's verses 13 and 14. They're being called one of the great moments of Old Testament revelation. They contribute as much as any to the way that Jesus thinks of himself. Whenever you see Jesus 80 times, I think 80 plus times in the Gospels referring to himself as the Son of Man, you ought to do a mental flip to Daniel 7 because this is what he means by it almost every time. It was his favorite name for himself. And these verses describe what it conveys. Verse 13, in my vision at night, I looked, and there before me was one like a son of man, coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the ancient of days and was led into his presence. He was given authority, glory, and sovereign power. All peoples, nations, and men of every language worshipped him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away. And his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. It's the emotional, the theological climax of this first vision. It's of someone who is undeniably human, looks like a son of man, but unmistakably more than a man because he comes on the clouds of heaven and can just walk into God's presence like no other man can. I don't know if you'll be excited to watch the coronation of uh, King Charles III next year, verse 14, as I guess a little picture of Jesus' coronation. And the moment in view is his, not when he came to earth, but when he went back, his resurrection and ascension. When as God the Son, he approaches his father, the Ancient of Days. He's completed the work that was entrusted to him as he died on the cross. And now he's given all authority in heaven and on earth. And it's such a key moment. All through Daniel, we've been told that everlasting dominion belongs to God alone, that he's the only one who has a kingdom that will never be destroyed. And now the Ancient of Days gives that kingdom to the Son of Man. Again, no one but God is worthy of worship. When uh, Nebuchadnezzar had the arrogance to demand that people should bow down and worship him, God humbled him turned him into a beast for a time. Now God actively encourages people from every nation to worship Jesus. And while the kingdoms of men are always limited in scope, in duration, and in power, the kingdom of Jesus will draw under its canopy all people for all time and will never be destroyed. And it's another core conviction 
that Daniel wants to drill deep into our soul this morning. It's meant to reassure us when we're confronted by the beastly kingdoms of man. Because although they are terrifying, they are never ultimate. And I just want us to stop and and check in on the, the mental picture that we have of Jesus. There is a danger sometimes, I think, for some of us that we get so familiar, so used to thinking of him as our friend and our brother, both of which things are wonderfully true, that we can sometimes just shrink him down more than we should. Uh, basically think of him as someone who's pretty much the same as us, but just a little bit better than us. And we're having our view of Jesus reinflated this morning. We're being reminded that he is the eternal king of everyone in every land. That he's not just someone you, you, you nod to and respect, not even just someone that you love but someone before whom we fall on our face in worship. And the bigger our view of Jesus, the stronger we will be in our faith. The bigger our view of him, the stronger we will be. But as we close, there's a a detail we haven't mentioned yet. If anything, I think it's even more amazing. It's about the final destiny of the kingdom. So the ancient of days gives the kingdom to the son of man. And then we're told three times that Jesus doesn't keep the kingdom to himself. See it first in verse 17, in that summary, the four great beasts of four kings that will rise from the earth. But the holy people of the most high will receive the kingdom and will possess it forever, forever and ever. Literally, that's to the forever and to the forever of forevers. That's forever. You get the the same point again in verse 21. As I watched, this horn was waging war against the holy people, defeating them. Until the Ancient of Days came and pronounced judgment in favor of the holy people of the Most High. And the time came when they possessed the kingdom. Once more, verse 27, then the sovereignty, power, and greatness of all the kingdoms under heaven will be handed over to the holy people of the most high his kingdom will be an everlasting kingdom all rulers uh, will worship and obey him and again i want to say there is so much strength in those words for god's people every bit as amazing as his greatness is his generosity Then you love the way that God chooses to share his own glorious kingdom that he alone is worthy to receive with people like us who don't deserve it. But we are being told that we can be 100% sure that if we've trusted in Jesus ourselves, if we've come to him on the cross, acknowledging our sin and asking for his forgiveness, Not only can we be sure that he will reign forever, but that we will reign with him. Sinners like you and me, not only forgiven when we trust in Christ, but given a share in his eternal kingdom and reign. It happens now in in one sense, we're transferred. The moment you believe in Jesus, you get transferred, says Colossians, from the domain of darkness and into the kingdom of the Son. You're a part of God's kingdom already. But we'll only enjoy it in its fullness when the Lord Jesus returns and takes us to be with him forever in his glorious new creation. But once again, I'm sure we can see how that hope will sustain us. Even if... And when the beastly kingdoms of men turn their power against us. It's another foundational reality. And taken together, this panoramic survey of human history, we'll get more detail next week and beyond. But this survey is incredibly powerful. Think how much good it would do us if we remembered these things. The the realism of the first point that the kingdoms of men are beastly. They will oppose God and his people. We need to know that. The confidence of this second point, that whatever the world looks like, Christ is on the throne. And this final hope, 
that we will reign with him. Foundational truths need to be drilled deep into our soul by the power of the Spirit. The more we treasure them, the more we meditate on them, the more we allow these truths to shape our perspective of the world, the more we will be strengthened to make our, our stand, like Daniel and his friends did all those years ago. Let's pray together. Almighty God, amidst all of the detail of this passage, some of which I'm sure we, we don't understand, we want to thank you for the clarity of this vision of the Lord Jesus, the one who, to whom is given all authority and dominion and power. We praise you that he reigns forever. And we praise you for his amazing grace that not only forgives us for our rebellion against such a great one, but then includes us in his kingdom. We're so grateful. And we ask that these truths that we thought about this morning would strengthen our faith, strengthen our hope, and strengthen our worship of the Lord Jesus, not just in these moments when we're together on Sundays, but as we seek to live for him 24-7 through the week. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, the words of this uh, final.